Good afternoon. The, the committee will come to order. I appreciate the patience of everybody involved here. Uh, given the timing of our votes, uh, I know we are quite delayed here by almost uh, two hours. So please appreciate your patience. Appreciate the two gentlemen who are going to address us today. Um, the, uh, today's hearing is entitled USAID Following the Money. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, both parties uh, uh, again for being here today. And the purpose of the hearing is to examine USAID's efforts to measure, monitor, and account for taxpayer dollars spent through U.S. foreign assistance programs. Over the past 10 years, the United States has dramatically increased economic and foreign military assistance. Since the year 2000, funding in these areas has risen sharply from approximately $18 billion to over $45 billion. The United States provides foreign assistance to 149 countries around the globe. Of this, USAID administers approximately $18 billion to over 80 countries. Fiscal year 2010, the top three recipients of USAID funding were Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Haiti. Together, the U.S. expended nearly $5 billion for flood relief, earthquake relief, infrastructure projects, political assistance, and other reconstruction efforts. Since USAID does not have internal internal capability, much of this work is carried out by international organizations, for-profit contractors, and nonprofit, non-governmental organizations, often referred to as NGOs. To administer and oversee these expenditures, USAID employs nearly 10,000 full-time employees and contractors. Despite the large number of personnel, USAID appears to have difficulty in fulfilling its fiduciary responsibility to properly account for many of these expenditures. According to the Inspector General Gamb Gambatessa's uh, uh, written testimony today, quote, our work has frequently identified planning weaknesses and potential improvements for documenting, documenting, monitoring, evaluating, and reporting on program performance. For example, OIG audits have often identified inaccurate or unsupported results. In fact, more than a third of the performance audits, audits and reviews we issued in fiscal year 2010 noted that data reported by USAID operating units or their parents were misstated, unsupported, or not validated." End quote. This is a staggering observation. This analysis is consistent with some of the things that I have seen, quite frankly, in both Afghanistan, in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Haiti. A recent IG memorandum uh, drafted to Administrator Shaw reported that a USAID implementing partners overstated numbers of beneficiaries in Iraq, specifically. Let me highlight a few of them. 262,482 individuals reportedly benefited from medical supplies that were purchased to treat only 100 victims of a specific attack. 22 individuals attended a five-day mental health course, yet 1.5 million were reported as beneficiaries. 123,000 were reported as benefiting from water and well activity that did not produce potable water. 280,000 were reported as benefiting from $14,246 spent to rehabilitate a morgue. In many ways, this is blatant fraud. In each country, I requested basic information regarding ongoing and completed projects from local USAID offices. And among other things, my request included a number of projects and, and projected an, annual co an actual cost, and whether USAID had verified the completion of the project. Officials in each country could not produce this most basic information. USAID has since provided some of the information I have requested. However, I am concerned that it took eight weeks and a formal congressional inquiry to assemble the data. This is data that I believe should be readily available to the American people. And on the slides, for those of you that are here in this room, you will see some of the pictures uh, that were, have been taken along the way. Americans are paying top dollar for foreign assistance. Unfortunately, taxpayers is not getting a top dollar results. In Haiti, buildings are in shambles. Mounds of trash cover the streets and electrical grids are substandard. More than a year after the earthquake, only 5 percent, 5 percent of the millions of cubic feet of rubble have been removed. As of November 2010, only 22 percent of shelters have been built. Having been there and seen it for myself, I wonder if these numbers are generous at the most heart-wrenching reality, though, is that many residents are still displaced, living among the filth and destruction. We are talking about hundreds of thousands of people. For those of you in this room, if you are looking at this picture, that is a classic sign that says, this rubble has been removed by USAID. They placed the sign in the rubble, and that is what they are dealing with in Haiti. You also, the 
bottom line, if the agency cannot accurately pinpoint its progress in any given moment, then it is failing to adequately oversee its expenditures. Given USAID's own challenges, I am increasingly concerned about the direct assist program advocated by this administration. Direct assist provides money directly to foreign governments, such as Afghanistan, which ranks, according to some, 179th out of 180 for the most corrupt countries in the world. With recent examples of corruption, such as the Kabul Bank, as well as complete lack of overstate infrastructure, I would like to know why the administration believes this would be a good idea to accelerate the direct payments to governments. We simply cannot trust that a foreign government will provide effective oversight of U.S. money. Necessary oversight tools are limited and accountability cannot be assured. If the direct assist program is indeed part of the administration's foreign policy toward places like Afghanistan, then I urge it to stop immediately. Part of the oversight discussion should also include an analysis of whether the United States is benefiting from these investments. It appears that in countries such as Pakistan, locals fail to realize that we are pro even providing assistance. USAID's, quote, from the American people, end quote, message is not widely broadcast or apparently not very well received. I look forward to hearing from Administrator Shaw on how we can improve in this area. If recipients, recipients are not aware that the American people are providing assistance, then it is questionable questionable, the United States is getting proper credit for all of its efforts. With the dramatic increase of foreign assistance, the Federal Government must ensure that it is conducting effective oversight in each and every step. I look forward to hearing from our panel of witnesses about the success and challenges they face. The subcommittee is ready to work with the departments in whatever way possible to prevent the waste, fraud, and abuse of taxpayer dollars. I would like to now recognize uh, the distinguished uh, uh, ranking member from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Shah. Mr. Cabatissa, thank you both for waiting so long. Our apologies on that. Both the Chairman and I probably wish we were controlling the floor. It wouldn't, wouldn't be that way. Uh, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for convening the hearing. Uh, and I want to thank the Administrator Shah and Inspector General Cabatissa for agreeing to testify here today. Uh, look, USAID is, is a critical tool for the United States foreign policy and for national security. In the past decade, we have tasked the agency with tremendous responsibilities for development, for humanitarian assistance, and have done that in some of the most hostile and challenging environments on Earth, including Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, and Haiti, and others. The success of USAID's mission in each of these countries is significantly important. Lieutenant General John Allen, the President's nominee to be the next commander of the U.S. forces in Afghanistan, recently spoke regarding the importance of USAID. His remarks are noteworthy. He stated that in many respects USAID's efforts can do as much over the long term to prevent conflict as the de deterrent effect of a carrier strike group or a marine expeditionary force. There are adversaries in the CENTCOM region who understand and respect American hard power, but they genuinely fear American soft power frequently wielded in the form of USAID projects. While the hard power of the military can create trade, space, time, and a viable security environment, the soft power of USAID and the development community can deliver strategic effects and outcomes for decades affecting generations. While foreign assistance may have no, mutual, no natural constituency here at home, it is helpful to hear the strong words and support from Secretary Gates, General Petraeus, Lieutenant General Allen for continued congressional funding of USAID's mission. In today's budget crunch, it is easy to pick on USAID as a soft target for cuts. Those proposed cuts, I think, are short-sighted. Aid is the key to building stronger sovereign governments that can support their own people in all of those countries that I just cited. And while I support fully funding USAID, I have also expressed vocal concerns over the past decade as the agency has struggled to implement robust accountability mechanisms and find the appropriate delivery vehicles for aid. In particular, I have been concerned that USAID has become overly reliant on international contractors as implementing partners has lost too much internal capacity and has implemented programs without the necessary monitoring and evaluation mechanisms in place. The result has been not only disconcerting levels of waste, fraud and abuse in many projects in Afghanistan, Pakistan and Iraq, but a lack of vision and focus within the agency. USAID's mission is so important we simply cannot afford to make these mistakes over and over again. So I am very encouraged by Administrator Shah's USA uh, Forward Program agenda. Critically, the agenda directly seeks to address the principal concerns that I have raised for many years and that have been featured in hearings before this subcommittee over and over again. Namely, USAID is planning procurement and implementation reform that should lessen the reliance on large international contractors. 
USAID is planning to build more internal management and policy capability, and USAID is planning to significantly strengthen its monitoring and evaluation capacity. I look forward to hearing from the Administrator Shah today about his progress in implementing this reform agenda and what Congress can do to support it. And the USAID Inspector General also plays a critical role in providing additional oversight and accountability of USAID. I have long advocated that the Inspector General put more personnel in the field and contingency operations to monitor projects directly. I have also advocated that the Inspector General do more to help USAID build monitoring and evaluation mechanisms into the programs at the beginning of the projects instead of at the end. So toward that end, I was glad to see that USAID's comprehensive pre-award survey of Pakistani institutions to determine their capacity to receive aid and work as implementing partners. I encourage USAID to do more to address the weaknesses that have been identified in these surveys prior to direct funding assistance. Thank you again, Chairman Chaffetz, for convening the important hearing. I look forward to having the witnesses testify so we can support their efforts in transparency and accountability. Thank you. Do any other uh, members have, uh, would, would they wish to make an uh, opening statement? Mr. Welsh? No. Okay. Uh, members will have seven days to submit opening statements for the record. And we are now going to recognize uh, uh, the panel. Uh, we are pleased to be joined uh, uh, by Dr. Uh, Shaw, who is the Administrator of the U.S. Agency for International Development, and uh, Mr. Donald Gambatisa, who is the Inspector General for the U.S. Agency for International Development. We appreciate the dedication that both of you have to this country, uh, to the good uh, practices of this country. I know your hearts are in the right place, and we, uh, we appreciate being here today for a, a candid discussion about how we can make the process better. Pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn in before they testify. If you would each please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that the witness, witnesses answered in the affirmative. We will now recognize Mr. Shaw for five minutes for his opening statement. I would remind you that uh, additional comments uh, will be inserted into the record. We will now recognize you for five minutes for your verbal opening statements. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Chaffetz, Ranking Member Tierney, members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the chance to be with you today and appreciate the chance to have a conversation about uh, our efforts to create a more efficient, accountable, and transparent government. That goal is one President Obama, Secretary Clinton, and I have been working hard to achieve. And it is one that I have made a top priority when assuming the role of USAID Administrator just 17 months ago. At its core, USAID is responsible for advancing opportunity and empowering people throughout the developing world. It is a core pillar of our country's national security and foreign policy strategy. We strengthen global food security, improve global health, lay the groundwork for economic growth. In fact, some of our fastest growing trade partners are longtime USAID recipients. We expand democratic rights of disenfranchised citizens around the world, especially in places like we are seeing throughout the Arab world today. And we provide crucial humanitarian assistance in response to natural disasters and complex crises, with our teams ready to deploy as they are currently deployed in and around Libya in some of the most dangerous parts of the world. In over 100 countries, USAID staff carry out our mission by engaging local partners, implementing projects against clear multi-year strategies, and evaluating our work so we can learn and improve our results. Two months after joining the agency, I instituted one of the most sweeping sets of reforms USAID has ever undergone, a package of reforms we call USAID Forward. It is an early outcome of Secretary Clinton's comprehensive Quadrennial Diplomacy and Development Review. This ambitious set of reforms is changing the way we do business, with new partnerships, an emphasis on transparency and accountability, and a relentless focus on achieving results for our development dollars. Through these efforts, we have rebuilt the agency's budget and planning policy capabilities at no additional cost. At the same time, we have established new oversight structures and vetting systems to ensure our assistance is more transparent and accountable than ever. My goal is to help the American people see in a transparent way how we spend our resources and what we get as results. We have started to make this possible by building the website, foreignassistance.gov, and clear online dashboard that allows users to easily track foreign affairs spending. Our Policy Bureau has created a series of new country development cooperation strategies so we can work with our foreign partners and with our implementing partners 
to set clear, defined goals sector by sector in programs around the world. We will make those public, as we are beginning to do with our uh, programs in an area we call Feed the Future, our Global Hunger and Food Security Program. With congressional support, we are improving our business at procurement and contracting practices, bringing modern practices to improve uh, up and update reporting systems, and focusing on working with more local partners and through smaller, more manageable contract mechanisms. We have created a board on acquisition and assistance review that has already reviewed large programs and broken them into smaller pieces to improve management and competition in how projects are awarded. And finally, we have established a world-class monitoring and evaluation system, one that gets us away from the practice, the traditional practice of counting process results and having them reported by implementing partners who carry out the programs, as was referenced previously, and one that uses independent third-party evaluations to help us understand what we are getting for monies we invest. For example, in seven of the 15 Presidential Malaria Initiative countries in which we have made investments to save children's lives from malaria, we recently found through independent evaluation that we have had a 36 percent reduction in, the, in all, in, in all cause child mortality, which means we are saving kids under the age of five from all causes because of our malaria program and saving them by the hundreds of thousands of kids a year. Over time, these shifts and these improvements in our efforts will help us do a better job of managing our programs in Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America and in Asia, and will particularly help us working in specifically hard areas such as wartime situations in Iraq and Afghanistan. It is precisely in those settings where we have focused a number of our uh, newer and more aggressive reforms to improve accountability and oversight, to expand the number of times our, our teammates and our colleagues are out visiting programs and seeing how projects perform, and where we have rolled out initiatives like the Accountable Assistance for Afghanistan, or A-Cubed initiative, that is helping to improve oversight not just of contract partners, but of their subcontractors and of the results that we are seeking in the Afghanistan project. Whether we are working in Afghanistan or Zambia, we do so for one very clear reason. Development is a core part of our foreign policy and national security around the world. We help by partnering with our troops, creating exit strategies and keeping them safe. We work to prevent famine and prevent food riots that are destabilizing around the world. And in saving millions of children's lives every year, we create the basis for stability and economic growth where people believe it often is difficult to do. That is why Secretary Gates has said doing development is a lot cheaper than sending soldiers. And because it is so critical to our national security, we look forward to this conversation to, for me to learn your ideas of how we can do it better, more effectively, and more efficiently. Thank you. Thank you. I will now recognize uh, Mr. Gambatessa for, for five minutes. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Chaffetz, Ranking Member Tierney, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you to testify on behalf of the Office of the Inspector General for the U.S. Agency for International Development. This afternoon I will share information about our efforts to promote accountability in foreign assistance programs. As you know, USAID has primary responsibility for managing and supervising the implementation of its programs and activities. Our role as an Inspector General is to assist the agency in combating waste, fraud, and abuse, and by promoting economy, efficiency, and effectiveness. We take our role in, as you are calling it, following the money, very seriously and draw on our highly skilled Foreign Service and Civil Service direct hire employees, as well as Foreign Service nationals, to perform this function across our 11 offices in Washington and around the globe. Since foreign assistance priorities frequently shift, we continually reevaluate our oversight posture and, when appropriate, make adjustments to better position ourselves to address emerging risks and challenges. For instance, in critical priority countries and disaster areas, we now have staff living and working in Afghanistan, Haiti, Iraq, and Pakistan. Previously, these countries had been served by regional offices. Our oversight covers the full portfolio of agency programs and extends to more than 100 countries. Our core oversight activities include both financial and performance audits and reviews. We complement these efforts with investigations into allegations of criminal, civil, and administrative violations. In fiscal year 2010, we issued over 410 financial audit reports. 
These audits covered $8.9 billion in funds and questioned more than $36 million in costs. Additionally, in 2010, USAID reported that it sustained $213 million in previously identified question costs. Our performance-related reports address program compliance, implementation, and results. When we identify areas that require corrective action, we make recommendations for program, and program improvement. Last fiscal year, we issued 66 performance audits and reviews with a total of 423 recommendations. Additionally, we also have a significant investigative portfolio. Our criminal investigators have full law enforcement authority and investigate allegations of waste, fraud, and abuse of U.S. foreign assistance funds and employee misconduct. Currently, we have about 200 open investigations. In fiscal year 2010, our investigations yielded 12 convictions, 90 administrative actions, these are contract or employee terminations, and $104 million in savings and recoveries, mainly from criminal penalties, civil judgments, and bills of collection. Our criminal investigators also deliver fraud awareness briefings to agency personnel, contractors, grantees, and host country representatives. Last year, over 3,400 individuals attended our, world, our briefings worldwide. Agency managers have a positive track record in responding to our recommendations and have developed appropriate plans to address every recommendation that we made last year. We are encouraged that today the agency and its leadership are taking steps to further improve its accountability posture. USAID has recently worked to improve its performance management by building more results orientation into planning processes and strengthening its monitoring and evaluation program. To promote sustainability of hard-won development gains, USAID is also doing more to increase its use of host country systems and partners. As you are aware, many of the accountability challenges the agency faces are intensified in critical priority countries and disaster areas. Monitoring the progress of these programs in such places as Afghanistan, Haiti, Iraq, and Pakistan is often hampered by security concerns, <coughs> infrastructure-related travel restrictions, frequent staff rotations, widespread corruption, weak government institutions, and diminished rule of law. My office is taking a number of steps in response to the accountability challenges in these environments. We have expanded our on-the-ground presence to provide greater audit and investigative oversight have increased outreach on fraud awareness and do more to promote hotline reporting. When a program requires enhanced financial scrutiny, such as cash transactions and disbursements, we conduct concurrent financial audits so that we can identify questionable expenditures and control weaknesses as soon as possible. On the investigative front, we leverage external resources to co uh, by coordinating with other U.S. law enforcement authorities and task force settings and working with local officials to investigate and prosecute crimes. We also monitor implementing partners' internal compliance investigations and do more to hold them accountable for reporting fraud. Proper stewardship of American tax dollars requires a solid accountability framework. We are committed to working with agency counterparts to ensure that framework, such a framework is in place. We appreciate your interest in our work and look forward to learning more about your interests and priorities. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. We are now going, I am now going to recognize myself for five minutes. Um, the, uh, the IG is reporting that, quote, more than a third of the performance audits and reviews we issued in fiscal year 2010 noted that data reported by USAID operating units or their parents were misstated, unsupported, or not validated. Um, what is your reaction to that, Mr. Shaw? Well, you know, when I when I started at USAID, I was uh, first of all. Let me ask: Is that accurate? I, I don't believe so. I, but I, well, let me let me put it this way: the agency and the entire U.S. Uh, system of providing foreign assistance and collecting uh, thoughts on impact has been heavily skewed over the last decade to a set of process indicators and reporting against those process indicators. The number of people who benefit. You know, what does that mean? People benefit the number of visits that were made to a particular uh, farmer. What, what has that accomplished? Has that improved yields? Has that improved incomes? Uh, even in health, the number of insecticide-treated bed nets that are distributed in communities. And we have uh, very elaborate, very costly systems for collecting a huge amount of process data. And I believe uh, implementing partners naturally uh, are, present optimistic 
data on what comes in that way. So in reaction to that, uh, I, with the Secretary's strong support, really restructured how we do evaluation in a pretty thorough way. Uh, we now approach this by doing what we call impact evaluations. And that means when you design a program from the beginning, you understand what your counterfactual is, you collect baseline data, and you define what the result you're seeking to achieve is and then measure against that. And, and, I, would, and, and I would just highlight one example. I don't know if we could put the, the, uh, the slide of the, uh, the Pakistani farmers on the, on the board there. But during the floods in Pakistan this past year, that wiped out 60 percent of the productive agricultural region in the floodplain around the Indus River. And it was a tremendous, tremendous challenge. Pakistan could have easily missed its winter wheat harvest. USAID working with an organization called the Food and Agriculture Organization, like, like, a UN I, partner. Sorry. I, my time is so short. Okay. I'm sure you could give me a, a, a 30 minutes of background of this. Sure. Uh, well, I just thought this would be a good example because instead of, instead of tracking things like the number of, of seeds that were distributed, we did an evaluation and found that because of USAID efforts, uh, we actually saw a 60 percent improvement in the winter wheat harvest in that context, and it was specifically targeting those farmers who had lost their farms, their productive I, livelihoods. I have floods. no doubt. I have no doubt that the good men and women, the USAID, are doing a lot of good. Mm -hmm. But when you have an inspector who comes in and says uh, more than a third of what is being reported is inaccurate, to be to be kind, and at worst is just downright outright fraud, then as the oversight committee, we're left wondering. Where is all this money going to? Mm -hmm. so, and I know, having visited with you, not in a hearing, I, I, th I know that you share part of this concern. Do you have anything specifically to refute what the Inspector General is coming up with? I mean, can you point to something and say, he was wrong in this instance? Do you have any specific example where that one-third number is overstated in itself? Uh, well, I do. I, you know, I think if you, if the Inspector General, and I think he would, you could ask him, he's right here, uh, I think he would probably suggest, if we looked at impact evaluations and assessed the credibility of our impact evaluations as they stand against our evaluation policy that we put in place under my leadership, uh, that that would, know, that would not be an accurate statement to say that a third of impact evaluations well, is fraudulent. Well, let's ask him. I mean, this is fiscal year 2010, of which you were involved with. Is, is your one-third number accurate or not accurate? Well, the, the number is, real, is a roll-up of, of various uh, aspects of what we do. When we say there is inadequate data, um, mm -hmm. we are saying that we either, either the data is not there or the implementing partner can't provide the data or the data is inaccurate. So the, the one-third number is a roll-up of, of all a number of different audits. So I, I mean, I, I can go back and we can go back and figure this out. The, con the concern is it's so overwhelming. It's so huge. We're not saying that, you know, we have very specific four examples that I put out there mm -hmm. that were just ha have the appearance of outright fraud. So we have to get to the bottom of, A, whether or not it's accurate, what are we doing? And, and Mr. Gambatessa, let me ask you. When you find something that is unsubstantiated, when you find something that you believe is fraudulent, you talked about the convictions and things, how do you deal with that? Is that through the Department of Justice? How does that work? Well, well first of all, these weren't necessarily fraud. Uh, because some were and some weren't. I understand some were and some weren't. But, yeah. but it doesn't mean that they were all fraud. So I don't want to overstate, Understood. I don't want Understood. To overstate the issue there. Uh, if, if we have allegations of fraud or develop uh, uh, potential fraud in programs, then we have our own investigators that go out and investigate this. And if we, um, if we have uh, enough evidence or probable cause to, to go forward, then we will take it to the Department of Justice for prosecution. Um, if, um, if we can't get a prosecution from the Department of Justice for whatever reason, we will try local prosecutions either with uh, the local Afghanis or local uh, Pakistani Thank you. My, my time has expired. I will now recognize Mr. Tierney for five minutes. Thank you. Mr. Gambatese, were those reports that we were just discussing, were those all under uh, Mr. Shah's direction that they were started or, or were their predecessors? Well, they were all issued in FY10. Right. So but when were they started? What were some they of them may have started before uh, Dr. Right. Shah took office, yes. Thank you. Um, Mr. Gambatese, let me ask you about the Gardez uh, Coast Road Project in Afghanistan. Are you familiar with that? Okay. Uh, so you are familiar with the New York Times report uh, recently that the contractors on that project in eastern Afghanistan were making protection payments to the Haqqani affiliated uh, individuals for security. That, that was the allegation, yes. Okay. Uh, are you investigating those allegations? Yes. Okay. Well, let me, let me say this. We, we have 
looked into those uh, allegations. We are looking into other allegations, but we're the, that specific allegation you addressed, we have looked into. However, we have not been able to uh, affirm them. Okay. We haven't been able to. I mean, how are we going to? We're not going to get a Taliban in to testify that that sort of thing. I mean, well, interestingly, we did. Well, if you read the Warlords Inc. report uh, that had to do with the trucking contract, uh, we did just that. So, if we can be helpful in any way, sure. and you want to talk to our staff or whatever, we'd be happy to do that. Administrator Shire, what kind of visibility do you have into the operations of these security contracts? Uh, well, let me let me st um, offer three or four thoughts on that. The first is we have under our under this administration we have more than tripled our presence, our physical staff presence in Afghanistan, in order to make sure that we had enough uh, support on the ground to improve oversight and accountability. Today we have more people outside of Kabul in the field visiting projects than we did when I started in uh, in all of Afghanistan. Um, number two, we have expanded our accountability efforts through a program we call A-Cubed, or Accountable Assistance for Afghanistan. That includes improved project monitoring and oversight. It improves uh, an effort to put in place 100 percent local cost auditing. It, it includes an effort to expand partner vetting, and it includes efforts to uh, do program design in a manner that enables more access to information. All of those things are uncovering are helping us do a better job of being transparent and accountable in the assistance program there. Uh, I do want to highlight, though, that you know, this is a war zone, and the Gardez Coast Road is a good example of, of, of a place where uh, I believe 19 of the workers on the road have died in the process of, uh, of helping to construct it, and there have been 364 security incidents. The priority to do that project is part of a civilian military integrated plan that says this is part of our campaign plan. And so, uh, in let, this, let me interrupt you, know, you if I can. I mean, that's all understood, yeah. as were the trucking contracts. But the bottom line comes down to when you start contracting it out and subcontracting it out, there's a real question of visibility and a policy question is this good policy? Uh, everybody wants to be safe, but is this good policy? that somebody is paying off people and that money then might be being used for things detrimental to our men and women. So let me there. just so say the policy is well, very let me, clear Let me, if I could, on, on that, okay. because I, I know which, I appreciate Sorry. your answer on that, but, <laughs> excuse me. So what steps, I don't know, are you using to reduce the reliance on contractors? What steps are you taking to make sure that you have visibility uh, into the contract and the subcontracts in those instances? And what steps are you taking to improve the accountability uh, on the performance of that and the avoidance of fraud? Well, it is a great question with respect to private security contractors. We have actually taken a number of steps in conjunction with the, with the government in Afghanistan to provide uh, more regulation and transparency of private security contractors' behavior and where resources go. We have, uh, in many cases, broken awards down into smaller components, so we have more reporting visibility on both primary contracts and subcontracts, including uh, private security contracts. We have put in place a very aggressive vetting system together with the uh, intelligence and defense communities in Afghanistan in order to make sure that we are collecting all information possible on potential uh, actors that are uh, risks and then taking actions as we did in this situation when we have information that is actionable. Uh, and and we have expanded our accountability efforts so that we do 100 percent local uh, cost auditing so that we can track as much of that money as is possible. Uh, all of these efforts have uncovered, you know, real cases and resulted in very specific actions that we have taken, uh, including on the Coast Guard as road. Okay. Now, the Inspector General made what I thought <coughs> was, some, was very good recommendation uh, about increasing the number of direct hire personnel, uh, and, and particularly for those th uh, things that are inherently governmental in their uh, nature on that. How is your progress on that, and what are your plans of the future for that? Well, sir, if I could, uh, if we could, well, I won't do this slide, but if we could put up the process slide, I could uh, share that in a little more detail. But there are a number of steps in our processes that are, I believe, important that direct hire personnel conduct or do, that USAID staff. Among them are program design, uh, partner selection, some degree of monitoring. Often you can extend your capacity to monitor with 
third parties and with Foreign Service national staff, but some participation in monitoring uh, and, and then accountability and oversight. And so we have actually done that very aggressively. We have been uh, executing a program called the Development Leadership Initiative that has been designed to increase the number of Foreign Service, uh, foreign service officers at USAID, and we have uh, brought in about 650 new Foreign Service officers between the last year of the Bush administration and the first two years of the Obama administration. I think because in a bipartisan basis and together with the military, there has been a recognition that we needed to reverse a 15-year, 37 percent attrition uh, in the basic human resources of the agency, and we are well on our way to, to accomplishing that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now recognize the gentleman from uh, Idaho, Mr. Labrador, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for being here, both both of you. And um, I, I'm a freshman member of Congress. I'm I'm new to all these things. I'm new to uh, learning about USAID and all, all all the things that you do. And I can tell you, I've never been more frustrated in my life as when I was in Afghanistan, and we were asking a single question, a simple question to to the USAID workers. How many projects have you started with the money that we spent, and how many projects have you completed? We spent about 45 minutes asking that question, and we couldn't get an answer. We couldn't get the numbers were being thrown out. It was 70, it was 50. They didn't know how many projects they had started. So we told them that we wanted that information. We wanted to know how many projects had been started, how many projects had been completed, and we did receive. Uh, quite an extensive response, but we still didn't get the final information that we were asking for. How do you, how do you actually know that the project has been completed? Uh, we know when the start date was, we know when the eight date was, and we know how much money was spent. And one of the things that I was most, most frustrated about was that when we asked what were your results, the answer was the result was that we spent X amount of money. That's all they knew is how money, how much money had been actually spent, and we're talking. This was the beginning of this year, so this is not something that was done under the prior administration. This, this is something that was recently, the beginning of this year, and they still didn't. You, you say that you've gone through a different process. I think you called it before. They were using a, a process results, and now you're using a different process. But at the beginning of the year of this year, they still did not know. How many projects, and and they didn't know how they they could verify. Can can you explain that to me, Mr. Shaw? Well, well, thank you for that point. I I take very seriously your point about results. I think that at the end of the day, we have to be able to articulate what we're getting for the resources we've spent in Afghanistan since 2002. For example, uh, there was a situation where there were 900,000 boys in school, no girls. Today, there are seven million kids in school. 35 percent of them are girls, in large part because of programs we have put in place, and we can go into the next layer of detail to identify how many teachers we have trained and what the outcomes are related to that. In health, we have seen a 22 percent drop in infant mortality as a result of expanding a basic package of health services from uh, which we used to reach 9 percent of the population, now it reaches 64 percent of the population, and it has been a longstanding USAID program with the Ministry of Public Health that has delivered that result. Um, in energy, which is a difficult sector, we have gone from 6 percent of Afghans with access to electricity to more than 14 percent today, including providing around-the-clock power in Kabul and including providing enough technical assistance to the local electricity authority so that we have been able to double revenue collections on an annualized basis so that they have a sustainability plan for those efforts. It's, it, to me, it is very important that we can go sector by sector like that and document how much we are spending and what we are getting as results, and we do have systems that allow for that. I, I can't so why, why wasn't that system in place uh, three months ago when well, we asked a simple know, question? I, and it is not like we just came yeah. you know, in the dead of night without yeah. any, any announcement that we were coming. They knew we were coming. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't have. Uh, I don't know why. I mean, that's that's the kind of data that we collect on a regular basis, and we don't even have that information now. I, I still. We asked for those specific results, and they told us how much money they're spending. They told us when they started the project, and they told us when they ended the project. But we did not get to this point where you. They knew you were going to be testifying here. We still don't have that information. Hmm. Okay. Well, I. I so I just shared some of that information. Yeah. I mean, we can do that sector by sector. This, I think, what you're looking at is some version of this spreadsheet, Correct. which mm. is 
how we basically track projects and programs against strategic priorities, and we do that mission by mission. The reality is when, when we get a request with you know, a great deal of specificity around what's been sent, you know, it may or may not be this data pool that does it, and we have to construct something else. But, I, but I would just step back and validate your point that I think it is important that sector by sector we can describe a specific set of results uh, or aspirational results. And, um, and, you know, and we, we should be able to do that. So I'm, I'm not sure who specifically you were speaking to in what context, but if they can't, but our education team is the one that tells me this, and we have our, our leader for the program sitting right behind me who talks to them on a weekly basis, and we do regular reviews so that we know we're on track. And a lot of times we're not on track, and then we make changes and course corrections uh, in that process. Thank you. My time is up. Uh, Mr. Mr. I recognize myself for another five minutes. Do you have a list of schools in Afghanistan that we have helped build, yes or no? You gave us some, some, some substantial yeah. numbers. Do you, where, when can I get a copy of that list? An actual list school by school? We could, yeah. con we could construct that. I don't know that we have that in an So how do you come up with system. the metric if you don't even have the list? Well, we have, we do have, I mean, I can tell, I don't have it in, right in front of me, but I, I know. I'm asking how long will it take schools. for you to produce that and give that to this committee? The I, you know, Ronald Reagan once said, trust but verify. Right. You threw out some spectacular yeah. statistics. Sure. I, I want to see it. I want to actually see the schools. I want to know where they are. Because okay. quite frankly, I don't believe you. Because based on the statistics that I'm hearing from the IG, a third of what you've reported in the past is fraudulent. Can you give me that list, and when will I have it on my desk? We can get you the list, and I'll find out how long it will take us and let you know. A month? Is that fair? I, 30 days? Yeah, a month is probably fair, but let me come back and verify that. Let me ask Mr. That. Gambitessa, how do you react to what he was talking about, the metrics, particularly for Afghanistan? Well, <clears throat> when we do our audits based on risk, and so we don't audit every program or every dollar of every mm -hmm. program. Uh, so uh, like I said earlier, when we make a statement that a third is, is the third of the things we have looked at. And, and also, I, I wouldn't say that every one of them is fraud. You used the word fraud, and, and I'm not, I, I would not say that every one are fraudulent. They, they, they could be just mischarged, and, Understood. and the and agency is getting the money back. So I, 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 I would not, I wouldn't use the word fraud. Or unsubstantiated. What I worry about is we have all these metrics thrown out. We have done this, and we had these 7 million people in school. But there's no, there's nothing, there's nothing to verify that. Mm -hmm. That is what we are supposed to be doing. Sure. Let me go specifically to Haiti, because that is one of the biggest human atrocities I have ever seen in my life. It is the saddest thing I have ever seen. Now, the, the IG is saying that only 5 percent of the rubble, in an optimistic case, 5 percent of the rubble has actually been cleared. Would you dispute that number, Mr. Shaw? Uh, I think the latest numbers I have seen are between 10 and 20 percent that are validated by the International uh, Haitian Relief uh, coordinating committee, so that is, I think, the most updated version. But, yes, it is in that. I, I was there. I, I couldn't see any of it. I, I mean, I, if they are clearing it. Sure. Well, we, you know, we can put up a slide on rubble removal. Go this ahead. I would like to show this slide sure. because I have a point about this slide as well. Okay. So let us put that up. And then uh, I would just make the point that, you know, we, we this have is been. Slide. Was this the slide you were hoping for? Yes. I got to tell you, mm -hmm. I want everybody to look closely at this slide. If I cleaned the garage growing up, my mom would have kicked my butt. That is not cleaned up. You scooted it over. You get half that picture is rubble that is still there. Oh, uh, well, I will tell you, look, I have I've been to Haiti probably 10 times, including prior to uh, being in this job, prior to uh, the earthquake, and then many times after the earthquake. There were 10 plus million metric tons of rubble created because Haiti is fundamentally the poorest country I in the Western Hemisphere. I think the estimate was 20 to 30. And that is not pushing it aside, sir. I think that really is clearing roads and walkways and what they did. I will say that the team we asked to create the rubble removal plan for Haiti worked with uh, a range of international partners. It was the same team led by a gentleman named Mike Byrne who, uh, who led the effort in New York City well, after let's the keep World going. Trade Center. The estimate well, by I the IG, it, I'm gonna, I we have I, to keep going. Okay. We have to keep going. 5 percent results after 16 months is totally unacceptable. When I visited with the, when I visited with the ambassador, he said we weren't going to participate in any more uh, rubble cleanup. Now, my understanding is they were, based on the, the spreadsheet that we got there, which didn't feel very complete to me, there were six contractors that received over $16 million, 
three of those six contractors, uh, based on the spreadsheet that was handed to me when I was in Haiti, said that their work has been complete. How can we justify 5 percent of the rubble being cleaned up, having spent tens of millions of dollars, and three of our contractors saying, yeah, I'm done. I, I did what I was supposed to do. Well, actually, the, you know, the new numbers are closer to 10 percent. And in that context, the actual amount of rubble that has been removed uh, is more than was removed after two years after the Aceh tsunami situation. So when you look at it compared to uh, situations like the World Trade Center or Aceh in Indonesia, it is a, you know, it's a, what it's a percentage standard of the, what, result. What percentage of the rubble would you think would actually be helped cleaned up by us, by the United States? Well, we're, in general, we're about 10 percent of total commitments in the overall reconstruction. We've been about 25 percent of the realized spending, so the commitments are what donors pledged and the realized are what how much donors money, spent. How much money is that total? I know there is money that comes from various agencies. Uh, how much money are we putting into Haiti? How much has been spent? In total, about se the supplemental was about 770 some million, and then in addition to that, there's about 220 million a year in standard funding through ESF economic plus, support. Plus, plus we have outside donors, right? The Red Cross, plus and outside others. donors, yes. Is the, so that you're up to close to a billion, yes. Plus the Red Cross, plus what else? Plus the outside. I mean, there was a other, whole bunch of celebrities other. from Sting to Bono to everybody. Well, yeah, celebrities don't spend as much money, but you know, other countries have made right. big commitments. But they raised. I, I read example. one report that they raised fifty million, fifty plus million dollars at some telethon. Fifty billion. Uh, fifty million. 50 million. Yeah, presumably. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. So we there's been over a billion dollars spent. Yeah. And we're saying that I, you say ten. The IG says 5 percent of the rubble has been cleaned up. Yeah, there's, well, there's, so first of all, all this money is not for rubble removal. In fact, we have worked very hard to try and get other donors and other partners to participate in rubble removal because it is, you know, frankly, a less sexy thing than some of the other potential investments. Uh, I would say overall it is important to recognize that Haiti is the poorest country in this hemisphere, that before the earthquake, the rates of access to clean drinking water or safe modern sanitation uh, were very low. The rate of the number of children stunted in Haiti was over 50 percent. That means kids go to bed hungry, grow up with chronic deprivation, not getting enough protein, and not having full. I, I've gone well beyond, well beyond my time. I, I so I, I, the only reason I, I, I say I all recognize that is to say, what a difficult situation this is. Uh, one last very quick answer: How many USAID people work full time on Haiti? Uh, probably around 200. Okay. Uh, we'll now recognize Mr. Tierney for five minutes. Well, tell us a little bit about what is being done in, in Haiti with the 200 people and, and with the, the resources that we are spending there and how it is structured. Who has got the lead? What role is the uh, USAID in comparison to the other organizations that might be involved? Well, you know, so in terms of what has been done, I, I think we, we actually are very proud of the fact that we, USAID was able to coordinate a major interagency whole of government response to what was the largest natural disaster we have ever experienced. More than 230,000 people lost their lives. And in that context, we mounted the largest and most effective humanitarian response ever. We fed more than 4 million people during those first few months when there were real challenges around access to food and security. We have uh, worked together with international partners, helped provide emergency shelter to 1.5 million people. We supported, together with others, more than a million people getting access to specific vaccines. And today, more people have access to clean drinking water in Haiti than they did before the earthquake because of some data-based decisions we made to make sure that as water was distributed, chlorine tablets and basic education was provided to help people protect themselves. Uh, you know, of the rubble, we think between 10 and 20 percent has been removed. And in sectors like agriculture and health, we have pursued a very strategic focus. So in agriculture, for example, which is 60 percent of the total employment in Haiti, we focused on four very specific areas of production. Uh, we have worked with private partners like Monsanto and others to help get improved hybrid seed varieties to those farmers. And we have seen uh, in many different instances a doubling of actual crop yields measured and verified uh, that leads us to believe that you know, the Haiti agricultural sector could become a more vibrant sector going into the future. We have also helped establish an industrial park in the north that will create 5,000 jobs next year on the way to creating 20,000 jobs by attracting a Korean company and others for manufacturing. And we have worked with partners like Coca-Cola to help create 
a juice industry with, in that case, with mango juice in particular, so that you know the core product productive assets of the country are contributing to the economy and employment. Uh, you know, you can't judge the effort in Haiti in one or two years. It will be a longer term effort. But Haiti has been a very poor country for a long time, and the, the and we have been very focused on taking the time to do deliberate planning and coordination in order to make sure that this time around the results are much, much, much better. So is USAID in the lead on this whole overall project? USAID works in coordination with the Department of State and other agencies. Who, a, what country, person, entity is in charge of the bottom line on, on the whatever might be the overall strategy of where we are going to try to let this country take itself? We have a special coordinator at the State Department, Tom Adams, and Cheryl Mills, who is So the United States has taken on the responsibility of, of he heading up this whole thing? No, uh, no, I shouldn't say that. No, the, the government of Haiti is responsible right. for their reconstruction. And there is an uh, interim Haiti reconstruction uh, commission that has been created that is co-chaired by the prime minister in Haiti and by the, um, by the former president, President Clinton, um, that has been incredibly helpful at bringing all the donors together under the government of Haiti's plan. And what kind of technical expertise does this group have in terms of people that can work with these donors? can plan out where the future of this country is going in terms of employment uh, and sustainability and things of that nature? It has some specific <coughs> technical expertise and it draws on resources inside the government and at USAID and other partners to do exactly those tasks. I will note that during the earthquake, 28 of 29 ministries collapsed. Mm -hmm. 15 percent of the senior level workforce I, I just I'm getting, and, trying to get a figure on, on that. Is, yeah. in, in the outset after this, obviously, everybody was trying to just survive and get people going and keep them alive and, and make ends meet. Are we at the stage now where we think we are stabilized a little bit and somebody is saying, okay, here is the grand plan going forward, or are we not there yet? Are we still putting yes. tourniquets on uh, bleeding problems? No, at this point we are in the phase of reconstruction, and it will be a, a long and challenging process, but it is one where we really do have to focus on trying to build back better. Some of the and there is a design, there is an overall overarching design of what we are reconstructing toward? Absolutely. It is the, the Haitian government strategy is about decentralized economic development in uh, specific targeted regions for both agricultural, to restart the agricultural economy and to promote industrialization and jobs and to do it in a way that helps people have economic opportunities outside of Port-au-Prince so it takes more of the demographic pressure off of Port-au-Prince. And that type of strategy is one that we support fully and our programs are really aligned against that strategy and, and our programs are you know, limited to those areas where we might be a lead donor or partner, uh, creating space for other partners to lead in other sectors, other international donors and partners. I, as I mentioned before, overall we are about 10 percent of the total commitments to Haiti and about 25 percent of current realized expenditures in terms of donor participation. Thank you. Now, now recognize uh, the gentleman from Idaho, Mr. Labrador, for five minutes. Thank you. Mr. Shaw, according to a recent memorandum from uh, Mr. Gambatessa, um, he stated that mon mon monitoring the progress of USAID programs in Afghanistan and Pakistan has become more and more difficult as funding is directed to the areas that are most insecure. In Pakistan, for example, much of USAID's assistance is directed to the federally administered tribal areas where USAID employees cannot travel. Audit work in Afghanistan and Pakistan has reported that the Office of, uh, of the Inspector General has reported that security conditions have either hindered program accomplishment or had the potential to create implementation problems. We actually made the same observation when we were there. We were told by, by the USAID uh, uh, workers there that, they, that we had a, a lot of difficulty going into those, those areas. Uh, to m conduct many of its audits, the IG's office will employ locally, locally owned contractors to conduct oversight. So the question to you is, um, do, do you agree with, your, with those assessments? And what specifically are you doing to fix this problem? Uh, well, thank you. I think when, when I started, I certainly felt that we needed to get out to see our projects in a more effective mm -hmm. manner. Um, there are two or three strategies we have deployed in Pakistan to accomplish that task. The first is we have worked on security to make sure that we have security as we go, but, but taking risks and getting out there. And in fact, we have had, even in FATA and neighboring areas, more than 160 staff visits to sites and projects over the last six months. 
The second is we've built some mechanisms that use uh, third-party monitoring and evaluation personnel, mostly local but often very highly qualified engineers that can look at road projects and conduct a specific assessment or educational specialists that can go into a school and make a careful assessment of what's taking place. And we're increasingly getting more data and information from those types of partners uh, that are out there doing that. And then the third, as I mentioned previously, is to make sure in project design we're collecting baseline data against certain types of counterfactual situations so that we can say in a statistically validated and verified way that kids are learning more because of the following programs. In, in FATA and in some of the contested areas, uh, we use a mechanism called the uh, Office of Transition Initiatives that has been able to get out uh, and, and support quite a lot of activity from building roads to improving schools. And uh, they actually are able to produce GIS maps that will document where their projects and programs are uh, in the community. And, and that's also been a very helpful strategy to accomplish that task. So do you visit the actual projects in, in those areas? Yes, our, our staff would, would visit those projects. And our Pakistani third party partners would also visit in a way that when they ha might have more time to conduct more careful assessments. How do you verify completion of the projects? Uh, we, we do visits. We rely on reporting from implementing partners. We rely on the third party evaluation mechanisms to uh, make those assessments as well. Yeah. Mr. Gambatisa, can, can you, do you agree with the statement that was just made by Mr. Shaw? And, and it just also, if you could please address to what extent has inadequate contract oversight or activities uh, resulted in money lost to the American people? Well, um, as, as we have the same problem, obviously, in getting out to mm. in, the, in the FATA and some other regions um, to the north there, um, we have been able to get out into some areas like Sindh and Penj um, Punjab and places south. Uh, and obviously, the agency has the same issue. We also use, as you mentioned in your, in your remarks, um, third parties, uh, other audit firms that will we'll hire local audit firms to go out and help us with our review of and in doing our audit work. Um, uh, so I, you know, the administrator obviously is, uh, is they are doing the same thing, basically. So I agree that you know, they are doing that. And the second part of your question was? Was, um, you know, to what extent has the inadequate contract oversight or activities management resulted in money lost to the American taxpayers? Uh, it is it's difficult to quantify that. But um, obviously, without, without proper oversight, it is really difficult to determine that. Um, both our inability to get out there at some times and sometimes the agency's inability to get out there and verify. So it, it, to put a dollar value on it, I am not sure I could do that. I, I imagine we could probably come up with something like that. But um, as I said earlier, when, when we go out and do audit reports, uh, audit reviews, we are not looking at every program or every dollar of every program. We are taking a, a slice of it and we are actually looking at it at a, at a point in time. Uh, it is sort of a snapshot in time from when the program began to when it ended. So if it is a, a five-year program, it would, would not be very worthwhile for us to go look at it during the first year. We have to give it time to, to mature, and then we would look at it at a point in time. And you know, as we were talking about the rubble earlier, well, we looked at it at a point in time where, where the rubble in Haiti was, was only 5 percent, and now you know, the administrator says that is improved. Well, I, you know, I can't. You know, confirm or deny that, because we haven't gone back and looked at it again. I am certain if, he's, if that's what Dr. Shaw is saying, that's, that's true. So um, uh, it's to put a, an actual dollar value on that, I, I really don't, I can't do that. I don't think we can. Okay. Thank so you. Could, could I add uh, just a thought? I, I, look, I, when I joined, you know, the comment about the morgue that you made, I, I read that, and Don and I had a conversation about it, and I actually read it out loud to my senior staff and said, this is exactly why we are launching USAID Forward, because we are not going to rely on these sort of process indicators that are reported in by the very partners that do the implementation. So when I say that in Pakistan we have reached 620,000 farmers through the flood relief efforts or that we have built 280 schools through our stabilization program in FATA and those areas, that is information that is coming in to us now from third party monitors. Now, it would be ideal to always have U.S. direct hires able to be out there assessing all of these specific things. Uh, but, but that is uh, not always possible. 
and we are all and we are pursuing this work because it's a core part of an integrated national security strategy and it's uh, and we need to do it to help keep our country safe and to help um, in some dangerous parts of the world provide opportunities to people to have an alternative to a path that is threatening to us and so uh, so i just i just want to say that because i think that's an important shift in how we think about monitoring evaluation and results reporting that's highly relevant to our reform agenda Thank you. I now recognize myself again for five minutes. I want to go back to Haiti and talk specifically about uh, uh, shelters and, and the, the lack of progress there. Uh, and I am referring back to this Office of Inspector General audit of USAID's efforts to provide shelter in Haiti, uh, an audit report issued of April 19th of, of this year. Um, in that report, uh, Mr. Gambatessa, it says, uh, as of January 6, 2011, grantees had repaired 1,875 houses. But their goal was 14,375. Can you help me understand what the, has, what the lack of progress is due to? Well, our, our, our report um, made several recommendations to, uh, uh, to, well, actually findings, and then made recommendations to solve the findings. It, it seemed like some of the problem had to do with uh, variations in cost, um, quality standards were different. Also, there was a an issue with customs, and eight out of eleven grantees experienced delays clearing customs from up five from up to, from six weeks up to five months. So they didn't they couldn't get the the uh, the, the uh, um, parts. And, and, the, and let's put in perspective. They, you know, there's home repairs, but there's also the shelters. Now the shelters that I saw were, and this is where I'm asking for clarification. Roughly twelve feet by twelve feet. This was these aren't some big massive apartment right. complexes or something. This is a very, very basic slab of cement, four walls, and a tin roof. Is, is that roughly the, I mean, those are the right. same. I'm sorry? Yeah, I mean, those are the same shelters that I was looking at that you're, you're talking about here. It says here in the report that USAID OFDA has a projected shortfall of 65 percent in meeting its goal. I, it goes, Mr. Shaw, how the numbers are so off base. They're so short of the, the nearly a million people that are there living amongst waste and feces, and I saw rats running around the school. We are so short of the goals. How do we answer that to the American people who have poured their hearts and about a billion dollars into such lack of, of progress? Well, I, you know, there are two, th two things I think that are noteworthy about that. The first is the initial strategy was to build as much temporary shelter as possible, and I think that's what you're referring to. But how many temporary shelters have we built? Uh, we've currently built 20,000 on the way to getting to 33,000, but the initial strategy was to build many more, which I uh, right. acknowledge. What, it, what we did was, as we were in the process of defining, of uh, doing what they called assessments of almost uh, just over 400,000 structures that were home structures, uh, they found that a certain percentage were red house repairs, not, uh, red, house, red homes that needed to be demolished and, and Can I go back here for a second, because I had to find this. In, in the USAID, at the uh, audit report says, by June 30, 2010, grantees had completed only 1,883 shelters. And you say the number, now that, that number is a little bit old. You are saying now saying that the number is over 20,000. It is 20,000, yes. Is that, yeah. is that your findings? Uh, the number of shelters that have been completed, 20,000? Well, again, we haven't gone back and looked at it. It's, it's been a year since then, right. pretty much, and so yes. It says, as of November 15, 2000, tees, grantees had built only 7,179 7, transition shelters, 22 percent of USAID's target. Right. So, I mean, there you can just see the rate. What is the know? difference between a transition shelter and I think I think all this conversation so far has all been about transitional shelters. They are uh, structures with plywood supports. They start with tarp. Then over time, you can put uh, corrugated tin and other materials to make it uh, a more longer term shelter. But they start as transitional okay. shelters. Because I did see a significant, and this was part of my frustration. Is part of what I saw was a bunch of tarps. They said yeah. USAID on them, but. These are literally, I mean, these are not tents that you, you know, not at some Coleman tent that you'd go buy down at, at Cabela's. These are literally a tarp on four pieces of plywood. 
Uh, well, they are, tr right, they're transitional shelters. The tarp actually meets a certain set of what we call sphere standards that can withstand wind and rain and other things. Uh, but but you're, but, so, but the, the other the, thing I the more, to, uh, the more permanent shelters, which as I understand, having read the material, are intended to only last three years. How many of those have been completed now? So the transitional shelters can last three years as they're built up with tin and other building materials. The, but the important thing here is that as we were doing the house But no, uh, my, my question is, how many of the more semi-permanent structures have been built? Because there's shelters and then there are temporary shelters. How many of the right. shelters have been built? I mean, they categorize, the IG put them in two different categories. Okay. Well, the two, the two categories I would use, and I'm, I'm just not clear on, okay, uh, I don't sure. want to answer in the wrong way. Uh, the two categories I would use are temporary shelters that are tarp and plywood based structures that can be improved over time that can last for one to two to three years. Right. And uh, the primary strategy of repairing uh, the, the yellow and green homes so they can be permanent structures for families or building homes that could right. be permanent structures for families. Um, so so we, we have those three primary strategies. And this particular IG report re refers to the uh, Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance that was doing just right. the temporary shelters and a strategic shift we made sometime last year based on the data that there were many more homes that could be fixed that people could go back into than we initially thought was to say we would do fewer temporary shelters and more yellow house repairs and greenhouse returns because that was a more well, cost efficient that, Again, that is the number I am citing strategy. in this report, that the commitment from USAID was 14,375 houses, but it only completed 1,800. Is there an updated number of that? Uh, I don't have it at my fingertips. We can get it to you. That would be, that would be most appreciated because we are talking about a magnitude here of like a million people, are we not? Uh, well, we have come down from having 1.5 million people in, in uh, tarps, tents, and temporary shelters to now 680,000. I, I would just note there are two important factors to think about. One is one of the roadblocks on rubble removal has been the inability to get enough staging sites from the government of Haiti. And so we continue to work with the government. I think we are optimistic that uh, they will manage to find sites that would allow us to accelerate, allow the international community and the Haitians to accelerate the rubble removal and create the space for the new housing. Thank you. My time has more than expired. Now I recognize the, uh, uh, the chairman of the full committee, um, Mr. Issa of California. for five. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I will follow up on that. <clears throat> now, I have been following USAID for 11 years uh, from when I was on the Foreign Affairs Committee. If you don't have the cooperation of the host country, why is it you don't come back to the Jur Committee of Jurisdiction and saying we are being impeded from meeting our goals? Because you are talking about abysmally failing. If this were New Orleans, you would be, be fired. FEMA got fired for doing a better job than you are doing in Haiti, didn't they? As far as accomplishment, I am not talking about your effort. Well, well I, would, I would just note, in Haiti, we are somewhere between 10 and 25 percent of the effort here. And, and I don't think we want to assume, uh, as we might if we were in a domestic situation. But, but let us go another way. We should the assume total responsibility. Haiti is the poorest there. country in the Western Hemisphere. $1,000 in Haiti is a whole year's money. A billion dollars for a million people is $1,000 a person. Am I off by a factor of 10, or am I right? Thousand thousands is a million. I'm I'm in a million. A million thousands is a billion. So you've you've spent a thousand dollars per capita if you looked at a million people that needed. A fa and I realize I'm using loose numbers and so on. But I'm, I'm looking and saying so you spent you spent a whole year's salary per person, and you tell me you haven't been able to clear most of the rubble away. What I want to know is when you do not have the cooperation of the host country to a sufficient level. And we, even if we're 10 percent, all the other 90 percent have the same concern. Why is it you don't come back to the Congress and to obviously the State Department that you work with and say we are unable to meet our mission? We are wasting money. We are having people 680 thousand by your own number still suffering more than a year out without homes. Well, first, I would just say on the on the money of the billion dollars that's been spent, about seven hundred million was spent in the first three to four months as part of the response, and certainly giving each person a certain amount of cash in that context would not have met 
the needs that we were able to meet, that food distributions to 4 million people, thousands of surgeries that saved uh, hundreds of lives. You, you, right, but we are talking about a billion dollars is our 10 percent. Right. That money hasn't been spent yet. We have been uh, in a pro some of it has been obligated, but that, that billion dollars has not been spent. That's okay. Let me switch gears for a moment to the IG. This is the closest we could be to a, a disaster outside our U.S., virtually. I mean, Haiti is about as close as anywhere you are going to get except maybe Canada or Tijuana. If we can't do better in Haiti, what does that say about our ability to have a poor country that needs 10 or 20 million people taken care of, whether it is all us by ourselves or the world? Are we organized for success on this scale based on what you have seen in Haiti? Well, you could just say no and I would be happy. <laughs> uh, it is difficult to answer that question. Because well, let me ask it another way. I was in the Army. I put up temporary shelters. And whether they are canvas or they have got some plywood, and I have certainly seen them in Afghanistan and Iraq, our soldiers are often living in some of the things similar. In your estimation, if we go in and we want to put a million people into those kinds of temporary shelters, isn't this a goal that America should be able to meet in a matter of, if not weeks, a couple of months? When you look at the subcomponents and the fact that the human beings that you're that you're trying to help are in fact the workforce to put them up, it doesn't take special machinery, it doesn't take bulldozers, it doesn't take heavy lift. All it takes is the delivery of the materials, and the materials once the port was operational could have been delivered enough for everyone. Isn't that true? I, I would think so in a perfect world. Well, I mean, Haiti is not a perfect world. We we get that. But once the port was opened and America said and our President committed to provide real relief, what went wrong that we are here talking about various numbers, but ultimately we are debating about how big a failure to bring relief in, in appropriate numbers to Haiti? Please. Well, oh, go ahead. Go ahead sir. Uh, well, I mean, did you lack money? Did you lack resources that America could have supplied? Did you lack the willingness of the government to cooperate? Uh, was there great waste? Was there an absence of people willing to put up their own shelters? I certainly think the last one we can assume there were plenty of people willing to put up their own shelters. Well, you know, I, I would just step back and suggest that characterizing the uh, large-scale humanitarian response as a failure was, would be something I would take great issue with. I think we stepped in well, wait, was very was quickly. Was 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 I appreciate that, you, that. I wasn't talking about that, although, to be honest, the media did a very good job of telling um, the world that it wasn't so good. But that was a televised event where the cameras were on. Today's hearing is really about the inability to accomplish with the monies given, what the goal was in a timely fashion after the camera lights went off. So if you would limit your answer to that, I would appreciate it. Well, you know, right now we are pursuing a comprehensive reconstruction strategy with the government of Haiti. And we are primarily taking the lead in a few specific sectors, agriculture, health, energy. The other partners like the Canadians are leading in sectors okay, like Okay. Well, with the indulgence of the Chair, who is temporarily mm -hmm. out, let me just, because I am not getting the answer. You, oh, there we are. You lean forward. Uh, with the indulgence of the chair who is here, the, uh, but leaning back in his chair, you have got mission creep right here. What I think I have I've, I've seen in the reports and the IG is reporting and you are agreeing to in a way is you didn't accomplish the originally stated mission. You have gone from soft housing to working on hard housing, but you are not dealing with 1.5 million in totality because before you ever got everyone into south house, soft housing, you have made shifts through the process. So you are always working on a next program that is different than the one you didn't accomplish. Would that be even a little bit fair? You know, I, no, I, I don't think so, not with respect to housing. It was never our goal to, uh, as Americans, directly build temporary shelters for the 1.5 million displaced Haitians. A big part of the strategy was to enable as many returns as possible to rural communities, to other cities, and to, to de intensify right. Port-au-Prince. We supported that effort and had four 500,000 people 
leaving Port-au-Prince into host country arrangements. We provided a lot of support for that and logistics for that, which was very important, but that was a government decision that we supported. Okay, well, because my time has expired and they have been very indulgent, let me just ask for a yes or no. Are you satisfied with the work you have done as a, a model for the effort of USAID in the Western Hemisphere? Sir, I'm I'm never satisfied with anything. I always think in this business and in this industry of saving lives and helping people who are vulnerable. Well, give yourself I, a, an A through F score, please. I I I wouldn't. I would say the the initial humanitarian response was tremendous, and I uh, have a huge amount. So you give of yourself an A for, for the original res response. What about today? I, I don't know that I'd ever use an A for anything, uh, I, but I, I would say that that was a tremendous initial response. I think we could we would have generally had more success with more rapid rubble removal and housing type issues if we had a confluence of factors, including more specific support from our partners in the government of Haiti to identify land for staging sites and to support uh, some of the issues that were faced at the at the port and with respect to customs. Uh, but in general, we respect the fact that this we are not in charge of Haiti. We operate in a bilateral partnership with uh, the elected government of Haiti, and we respect that and work within those within that framework. And I think that is well, Thank important. you. And, and Mr. Chairman, thank you for your indulgence. Thank you. I now recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney. For thank you. Thanks. <laughs> and I won't lean back. I will be deemed gone or something. <laughs> Uh, so I think we are all trying to get at the same thing here in different ways. And, and it is a bit why I asked the question earlier about whether or not there is an overarching plan of what everybody hopes to accomplish long term. And if that plan would then identify which com country or entity is responsible for what aspects of it, uh, and then an idea of how much money each entity or aspect of the country would be expected to spend to accomplish that end, and then how do we measure where we are going against it. Now, is that something, a, a document, a set of documents that you could present to the committee that would show us that? Yes. Okay. If you would do that, I would appreciate it. We'll put that on the record, Mr. Chairman. The other thing is that I know that the initial response, as you said, was tremendous. I mean, it was, it was an incredible burden on everybody, and it was a, a response on that. There was a period of time after that when there was some difficulty determining who at the Haitian government was going to respond to give direction. Is, is that correct? Uh, well, President Praval ultimately is was accountable is and was accountable for uh, for those decisions, and we've been in very constant and uh, direct communication with him, with his prime minister. But I think you mentioned there were twenty nine ministries that were uh, in pretty sad shape after the earthquake. Twenty eight out of twenty nine ministries had collapsed, right. and so that I would assume that that gave some level of difficulty in getting organized and getting direction for a number of things. That's correct. Okay, uh, and and I, I think that. That in and of itself would probably cause some waste or, uh, or misspent money at some point in time, not for intention to be wasteful, but for circumstantial uh, but con conditions. So that, I, and that is also why we helped set up the Interim Haiti Recovery Commission, and, uh, which is co-chaired by the, Prime Minister, the Haitian Prime Minister and President Clinton. It includes as board members a number of major donors and multilateral partners. And, uh, and that was a mechanism that helped bring people together uh, at precisely a time when, you know, the Haitian government was clearly recovering from a tragedy that we can only begin to imagine. So if, if I can step back from Haiti and, and, and look at the broader picture now of what USAID is doing mm -hmm. on that, you have talked about some of the aggressive reform agenda items that you want to implement. A lot of them address some of the concerns that this committee has had and I personally had and the committee has had uh, on accountability, on transparency on trying to bring in-house those inherently governmental functions, about bringing in people that are trained, and if we have to have contractors, people that at least can manage the contractors and monitor them and hold them accountable uh, and all of that. And, and you are progressing, it seems to me that you are progressing in that area. If the budget were cut to the extent that there has been some proposal, the 2012 budget, to be cut to $37 billion and then within four years after that down to $29 billion, is that something that is workable to continue on that reform agenda and get that accomplished while your budget is shrinking? Uh, and how do you assure people that if not, I assume you are going to say not, you put it in for the budget, how do you assure us that that money is well spent and not running into some of the difficulties that we have heard here today? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, no, sir. If, if we were to face the almost 30 percent across the board cut, 
uh, we would we would not be able to continue any of our reform efforts. And in fact, the the most important in my mind is our procurement and contracting reforms. That that is very consistent with your writings and and uh, public speaks uh, speeches about this subject. And we are relying very much on our ability to invest in expanding our procurement workforce to hire 70 specific civil servants who have the expertise to help us shift from cost reimbursement to fixed price contracting and to use more milestone-based performance award mechanisms, which we have built and we are now propagating out. But it takes unique expertise to put that in place and to make that work. Uh, and, and so we are on a path here. I'm, uh, I, you know, it's important to maintain that path in order to be able to achieve the vision we are talking about. Thank you. Now, Mr. Chairman, I am not going to ask more questions. I would like to look at the material that Mr. Shiner has put in. But we have had a history of over a decade now, probably two decades, of, of just hollowing out USAID uh, and just eviscerating the personnel that were there that had the experience and had the training and the cap capacity uh, to not only get U.S. Uh, aid out to countries and have them work well, but to also monitor the money and do the accounting and make us feel more comfortable. So on the one hand, we have hollowed it out. On the other hand, we are complaining that we are not getting the accountability and transparency that we want. It seems to me that if we continue down the path of hollowing it out, not providing the resources, um, you know, we are just creating the situation that we say we want to solve. On the other hand, Mr. Shah, I do think that there is a responsibility here to, to show this committee uh, in real time that improvements are being made and that a lot of these, uh, these concerns are being addressed and that there are substantial savings on, on that basis and, and moving forward, because I don't think the patient's level is going to last forever. And that is notwithstanding how important some of us think that uh, development and aid is in terms of our national security uh, picture. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. And in closing here, I do, Mr. Gambatessa, I just wanted to give you a last opportunity. Is there something else that you wanted to share with the committee that you plan to share that didn't have an opportunity to address? Uh, no, the only thing I would like to say is that, you know, most of our work, our audit work is, is, comes up and, you know, inherently uh, it, it points the negative. I mean, we, we do accentuate the positive when it is there, but um, <coughs> primarily we are looking at ways to improve programs. And so for improving programs, we are saying that it isn't working properly. Um, I, I have to admit that um, <coughs> many of the issues, uh, Mr. Tierney mentioned the issue with staffing. Many of our audit reports have indicated that uh, staffing is a significant issue in USAID. Um, the issue of uh, procurement reform, all, I, I'm very heartened by uh, Dr. Shaw's um, uh, um, movement toward fixing some of these problems, and I hope that they will work. I think they will with his, his leadership. Uh, I, I believe that uh, he is pushing the agency in the right direction, uh, and I think that with the, with the proper support and the proper budget support that many of these issues that we have identified in the past, I think, can be um, fixed. I appreciate that. And to the men and women who work specifically with you, I know they are small in number. You are going into some of the most difficult uh, situations uh, on the face of the planet, and we appreciate their efforts. And, and I want them to recognize the value that the Congress places upon their work, and uh, I know it's hard for them to be away from their families and whatnot. And the uh, same would be told for the people around the world uh, serving in USAID. Mm -hmm. A lot of good people with the right heart, um, uh, dedicating their time and talents away from their families, difficult uh, uh, security situations, difficult living uh, arrangements. Um, I don't want to detract from their good efforts. It is the role and responsibility, though, of the Congress to hold people accountable and to provide that data and information. And to that, to that end, I do think that the agency uh, is failing to provide data to this body in a timely fashion. There, members of Congress spend a great deal of time flying at great taxpayer expense to go visit these situations around the world, and uniformly, we have the most difficult in time getting the most basic information. I just want to have your ongoing commitment that we are going to be able to access that real-time data in what is accomplished, what are we spending, and then be able to uh, go see what is actually being spent. And I think the American taxpayers should know where their billions of dollars are being spent. Uh, well, Sarah, you, would, you certainly have my commitment. Um, I would invite you personally and other members of the committee to come potentially with me on, on some of these trips. Um, I would also ask that I appreciate your deep interest in the reform effort we are taking. We, I think we are implementing the most aggressive reform across any Federal agency here. I think it is very important, and I welcome your ideas and thoughts on how to make it better. And, uh, and you know, to the extent that you are continually interested in this, I would also uh, like the opportunity to demonstrate 
to some of our programs like Feed the Future, which is working in 20 countries, which is targeting moving 18 million people, including 7 million kids, out of a state of poverty and hunger, and which really does bring together so many of the best practices of what we have learned about development in terms of private sector engagement, accountability and conditionality, and putting in place the kind of measurement systems that let us know in a very verified way, I appreciate your highlighting that, well, that we're, we're saving lives and improving livelihoods around the world. I, I appreciate that. I, I think I speak for members on both sides of the aisle to say, look, we want you to be successful. We've got human lives who depend upon it, and, and we allocate a lot of resources in order to do this. With that said, I, I, I just I need to say one more time, because there have been good relief efforts, probably in the, the immediacy of what happened in Haiti. But having seen it myself, having read this report, having gone through it, I honestly believe my own personal assessment, 16 months after that devastating earthquake in Haiti, I think our, the totality of the U.S. response has been pathetic and disappointing. And yet, despite a lot of money moving in that direction, and undoubtedly a number of lives that have been saved. But we still have hundreds of thousands of people living in conditions no American could probably even fathom how bad it is. And when you have metrics that say a third of the performance audits for the department were either misstated, unsupported, or not validated, that raises a lot of red flags. When we are arguing about whether or not the rubble removal is 5 or 10 percent, that, that is a stunning number that is shocking 16 months after the effort. And when we are missing our goal by 65 percent in terms of building the, structure, the, the shelters, when we say that we have only achieved less than 25 percent of the goal, it is just stunning and disappointing because the resources in the United States of America being brought to bear, the support that you personally got from the President to make this stuff happen, and then to see those types of results, again, I am just looking at the metrics here and concerned about the it is devastating, it is disappointing, and it is unacceptable. And that is my concern. If we can help uh, uh, moving forward, I look forward to working with you. Uh, I appreciate your com commitment and your tenacity. I know your heart is in your right place. I appreciate you um, coming before this committee and spending time with us here. There is lots to improve, and I appreciate your attitude of saying, hey, look, we can always improve. So mm -hmm. um, at this point, we will hold this uh, committee in adjournment. Thank you.